thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, the topic of this discussion is the anatomy of a law firm. What I'd like to present to you is kind of the business side of a law firm. We formed our law firm on June 1st, 2010, and we faced a number of challenges getting it started. We face a continuing number of challenges going forward in terms of finances, compensation, marketing, and those sorts of things. And so those are some of the things I want to talk to you about. Well, our firm started on June 1st, 2010. The story begins way before that. It really begins in 1984 when I left the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and joined the Securities and Exchange Commission. It was assigned to a branch, which is kind of a small investigative unit, with four other people who have basically been lifelong friends and have practiced law with me ever since at different at the SEC and then at different law firms. So that's kind of our core group. I left the SEC in 1988 and I joined a Richmond-based firm called McGuire Woods. It's now a multinational firm of over a thousand lawyers. I was in their Washington office and there I met James Murphy, who had gotten out of uh, Vanderbilt Law School, went to Los Angeles and was practicing securities law there, but decided that he wanted to raise his family back in Richmond. So he moved to Richmond, got a job with McGuire Woods, and there he wound up practicing products liability law, because that was what was available. So he was representing DuPont in a series of cases involving leaky pipes. And while it was good work, he didn't really enjoy it that much. And so he left McGuire Woods and went over to become a partner at a Richmond firm called LeClaire Ryan. Now, coincidentally, Gary LeClaire and I went to law school together and had known each other for a long time. It's a very small world that we, that we operated in. Gary had left a big Richmond firm, Hunton and Williams, with Dennis Ryan, and the two of them started a law firm in Richmond above a sushi bar, and they had a desk and a chair and a box. And whoever got there first got the chair, and the other guy had to sit on the box the rest of the day. They, had, they were building and building that firm, and by the early 2000s, they had about 60 lawyers and a really well-known brand in Virginia. And so James Murphy came over as a partner to start working there. I'll tell you a little bit about law firm nomenclature, okay? So when you join a law firm, you generally join as an associate. That means you're an employee. Those are generally the more junior lawyers. In the old days, you would try to work yourself up to partner because law firms were organized as partnerships. That's what the bar rules required. Those rules have loosened, so they're no longer only partnerships. They can be limited liability companies, or we're, we're just a regular corporation. But people still use the term associate partner. Partners are sometimes equity partners, meaning they own the business, or non-equity partners, meaning their salary, but they're still considered senior enough so that the world looks at them as a partner. So when you're with a client, a client's going to want to know who's going to be working on my case. Is it going to be an associate? Is it going to be a junior partner? Is it going to be a senior partner? Those are the terms they use. Within the law firm, we use the term associate. We use the term officer for our non-equity partners. There are senior lawyers who function to the outside world as partners but don't own the law firm. And then we refer to shareholders as the owners of the law firm. So those are kind of the terms. Um, you'll also hear the term counsel. Those who tend to be senior lawyers who are partners, we don't really know what that means, so we've never used, we've never used the term at our, at our firm. Well, James Murphy was a, is a smart guy and an ambitious guy, and he thought that he could use that LeClaire Ryan platform, and he could build a firm out of Richmond, Virginia, of national prominence. And so he put together his strategic plan back in May 2001. And he started out with, why should he have a plan? He's a big believer in the seven habits of highly effective people to begin with an end in mind. And so that's why he wanted to start. And because Gary LeClaire and Dennis did it, and though we no longer work with LeClaire, work for LeClaire Ryan, we're still good friends with them and we still admire very much what they did. So they were a real inspiration to what James did. So James and Richmond put together a plan of what, what, would, a, what would a nationally prominent law firm look like. Um, and his goal was to have national prominence by December 31st, 2006, with one mission, excellence in client service. So he talked about getting a budget. He talked about expanding the practice to other broker-dealers from the Richmond-based broker-dealers that they were working with. And he talked about bringing us over from McGuire Woods in Washington and starting a Washington, D.C. office for LeClaire Ryan. That would be the first non-Virginia <coughs> office that LeClaire Ryan ever had. And so we did that um, and started that office for them. Timing's always been great for us. We started that right after 9-11 in October. In, in October 2001, we started their Washington office. And so LeClaire Ryan then was about 60 lawyers, and we moved forward and we thought we were developing a national brand. Meanwhile, LeClaire Ryan itself, I'll get to that in a second, LeClaire Ryan itself was undergoing a terrific growth spurt. They're, they are now from two guys above a sushi bar. They are 350 lawyers, they're one of the largest 200 law firms in the United States, and they have offices from coast to coast. 
just a remarkable success story. And so you say, well, McGonagall, if it's so successful, why don't you stay? What is wrong with you? And the answer is that when you get to be 350 lawyers, things, things happen in a law firm. For one thing, you run a 350-person firm much different than a 40-person firm. There, there, by definition, needs to be more bureaucracy, more policies and procedures. And while that's necessary, it's not a lot of fun to have to be involved with that. The second thing that happens, which is even more important, is that conflicts develop. So you can't really represent one client and then represent someone else who's going to sue that client. Clients take a very dim view of their own lawyers suing them, okay? So that will develop in a big law firm. In particular, what happened with us is LeClaire Ryan had a prominent bankruptcy practice, which is a terrific practice. But what you do in there, a lot of times, is you're representing the debtor that goes into bankruptcy. And now you have to go after the banks. And you have to have arguments with the banks and litigation with the banks about how much we're going to pay you. We're not going to pay you 100 cents on the dollar. We're going to pay you 10 cents on the dollar. Well, the bank says, forget that. It's got to be 90. So you go back and forth with that. Well, those banks are our bread and butter. They're our clients. And so you can't really be in a firm with a prominent bankruptcy practice and a prominent securities practice. So we decided at the beginning of 2010 that we would start our own firm. We would call it Murphy and McGonagall. Now, a little bit of law. When you're working for someone, you can't really be in competition with them, right? That's against the law. You owe a fiduciary duty to your employer. But with lawyers, it's a little different. The rules of professional responsibility require lawyers to be mobile. We are allowed and, and sometimes encouraged to move from firm to firm, per particularly because of conflicts and things like that. So we don't have that same kind of tight rules that you would have if you were a non-lawyer working at a firm trying to set up a company. So we're allowed, under the law, to speak to other owners of the company, other partners. They call them shareholders at LeClaire Ryan as well. But we couldn't speak to our non-equity partners, and we couldn't speak to our associates, and we couldn't speak to our secretaries because they were still employees of LeClaire Ryan. So we had to kind of do this quietly and keeping it to ourselves. So our partner, Jerry Eisenberg, was a big movie buff. Remember this movie, Seven Days in May. If you've never seen it, it came out in the early 60s. There's also a novel. It's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun to see. Burt Lancaster plays a general who's decided that he's going to overthrow the government of the United States by military means because he doesn't like the policies of the president. And the way they communicate, the way the conspirators communicate among each other is through what they call the Preakness betting pool. So they talk about, are you in or are you out of the Preakness betting pool? So Jerry Eisenberg would come in to me every morning and say, how's the Preakness betting pool going today? Which means, how are you going, coming along, moving the firm? So we called it the Preakness betting pool. And on, on the uh, third weekend of, of every May, when the Preakness runs, we have a little contest at our firm to see if you can pick the winner and you win a prize if you do. This was our project team. One of the things that we did uh, early on was identify people who could help us, knowing that we couldn't do it all ourselves. So Murphy and I, yeah, that's me, Murphy's on the other side, we hired a law firm because we know that we know what we're doing when it comes to securities law, but we don't know exactly what we're doing when it comes to negotiating a lease, when it comes to drafting corporate bylaws, when it comes to setting up the corporate structure. So our friends at Spots and Fain were excellent at that, and they helped us very much. We got a very good accountant, which is very important for us to put together the projections and the budgets that we were going to need when we went to the banks. We got a web designer who was the wife of one of our partners and who did a great job for us. Our furniture person was a woman named Karen Murphy, who happens to be married to James Murphy, so that worked out very nicely. Um, we have a good relationship, but you know, one of the things that I still think is kind of funny is, is as we were putting the firm together, we had to get a chunk of money for seed money. And Richmond, we're doing this through Richmond because that's where all of our contacts are. And Richmond is a small town. So we don't really want people to know that Murphy and McGonagall are out looking for space. Murphy and McGonagall are out starting new bank accounts. So Karen took the money, and she was the one who paid that bill. So I wrote this very large check, and I handed it to James. And I said, James, I will never really pry in your family life, but how is your marriage with Karen right now? <laughs> but it was fine. And then Steve Bass, who was a facility, he was, a, he was in the military for a number of years, and his latest job uh, was he was the facilities manager for Virginia Commonwealth University. So he had a really good understanding of what you need in a building, what you need in terms of technology, and how to move it. And these folks, starting in February 2010, started working very hard to get us up and running by June 1st, 2010, which was our goal. Now, this is what we started out with. We were in quite a headwind. Uh, in 2010. Um, law firms laying people off. The, the news was, was completely bad. So we started to go to our banks to try to arrange our financing, and they said to us, sit down. 
They said, you know, don't you, that most new businesses, especially small businesses, fail. You understand that, right? We well, said, well, yeah, we understand that. And, they said, and you know that this is the worst time to start a business since the Great Depression in 1929. You know that, don't you? They said, yeah, yeah, we know that. They said, what's your business plan? We said, we think we can get people to pay us for our judgment. And they threw us out of the place. <laughs> um, we did start to put together our different cash flow projections. And you know, when you do these, right, um, you look back on what is your practice and how much money have you made. Well, as you heard, our practice is in the securities industry. We defend broker dealers and investment advisors and individuals when they're in trouble. We give compliance advice. At the beginning of any year, I have some idea of the cases that I have right now, and I have some idea of how much revenue they're going to generate. I have a pretty good idea of our regular repeat clients, the broker dealers that use us all the time, and I have a pretty good idea of how much business they're going to generate. But I have no idea, really, of who's going to walk in the door and who's going to hire us for a big SEC defense case, which tend to be one-off cases. So those I have to estimate, and I kind of look back on the experience I've had in doing this since 1984 and look at the trends and say, I don't know exactly where it's coming from, I just know that every year it does. So we put together projections, and you, when you put together projections, you try to do best case, middle case, and since this was our money, we thought about starving to death, worst case. Well, we took the worst case and thought, well, if we, if we present worst case to people, we'll never disappoint them, right? So we walked into our first bank, BB&T, which is a very good client of ours, and you're going to have a BB&T uh, securities representative here next week, uh, John Young, who I, I commend that lecture to you. We sat down with their bankers, and we showed them our projections, and they closed the door, and they said, a couple things you need to understand, okay? First of all, when we see revenue projections, the first thing we do is cut them in half. So when you come in here with your worst-case projections, that's great, but this shows a business that's going to fail, and we're certainly not going to lend money to you on that basis. So what you need to do is you need to think more about these projections on worst, moderate, and best, and how can you justify the moderate, because that's what we'll be looking at. And you also ought to be talking to other lenders, because BB&T is the ninth largest financial institution in the United States. It's a very conservative sort of place. There are other bankers that might be more aggressive, and that's what happened to us. BB&T was willing to give us a credit line, but it was going to be tied to our receivables, so we didn't have a lot of flexibility with it. Capital One, primarily a credit card company, that's what you usually think of Capital One as, but they've become a bricks and mortar bank over time. And so they're looking to get into different lending relationships, and they were willing as a result to be a little bit more aggressive than BB&T, and so they gave us a credit line that was, that was easier to use, much more flexible. Now, why do you need that? This is probably true of all startups, but especially of law firms. Revenue in a law firm does not start, best case scenario, until day 120. Okay? Why is that? Well, we have to get the work in, we have to do the work, we have to build the work, so that's going to be day 45, and then clients are going to take 30 to 90 days to pay us. Okay? So we're going that long without any revenue. On the other hand, the secretaries and the landlord and the associates, they kind of like to get paid every day, every week, right? They don't really want to wait 120 days. So you have a lot of expense and you don't have the matching revenue. So at the beginning, at least, you need to have some kind of flexibility. And that's what the credit line did for us. Again, Richmond's a small town, so we incorporated the law group in April 2010 as the m and law group. Now, I hope the Mars people don't worry about that, but there was no chance that they would confuse us with their great candy, so we're not too worried about that. Um, but the reason we have to do this is because uh, corporate filings are public. And it's probably something that you wouldn't look at every day, but if you happen to be in a particular town and you're in the law business, like in Richmond, Gary LeClaire looked at that every day, okay, to see who's incorporated. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a lead for a client. So we became the m and Law Group. So then we had to decide, we're coming up to June 1, we had our long list of things that had to be done. We had to get space, we got that done. We had to get computers, we got that done. We had to get professional liability insurance. We had to line up health insurance for everybody. All these things were, were, are, are on our list. And we get to May 2010, and we have to decide, are we going to do this or not? And the list was about 60 to 70% complete, and we thought we could get the rest done. But it was a big leap of faith. So we got our new partners together, went over this list to try to decide go or no go. Now, we knew this was going to be an important meeting. And so we videotaped it. And I'm going to show you now so you can see the discussion that actually went on.
This is James Murphy speaking. And so the decision was go. <laughs> and so we left with Claire Ryan and started Murphy and McGonagall on June 1st, 2010. Um, Richmond, you know, had their act together. They had, the space was a little spartan, but as you can see, desks, chairs, telephones working. I was in charge of DC. Not so much. <laughs> we had the crates going, we had some blackberries, but uh, it, was, it was actually a fun time and we eventually did get furniture about a year and a half later. We got some good publicity right away, which really helped us. People were interested in, in new law firms starting, so a really nice article in the Washington Post helped us. And then we also got this, which uh, a little bit of news coverage, which also is a pretty good description of, of what the base of our firm is. So let me play that for you. Murphy is running the new law firm from an office across the hall. We ran a uh, horrific a rental deal in places like New York and Washington and here in Richmond to open up offices and then staffing the firm. We just have been inundated with terrific resumes, highly qualified people. After the Bernie Madoff pyramid scheme and financial institution fraud that led to the recession, the government is stepping up regulation. <coughs> Now, a couple conclusions you can draw from that. One is that June 1st, 2010 was a really slow news day in <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. But, but that is kind of the things that made our firm work. We were able to get some great real estate deals. We were able to bring all of our folks with us. Um, we, had, we had very good clients. Uh, the part about Virginia becoming kind of the center of securities litigation, we had high hopes for that. It hasn't really panned out that way, mostly because the courts in, uh, in Virginia and the appeals courts are very skeptical of the government. So the government doesn't have as wide a reign as they do when they bring a case up in New York. So New York City still remains the place where most securities litigation happens, but we have an office in New York City, so we're okay either way is how we look at that. Um, Gary LeClaire <laughs> believed very strongly and, and taught us that you really need to write down what you believe in, especially when you're a firm of immigrants, of people coming from different places. For years, People didn't really move from one law firm to the other. You joined a law firm out of law school and you stayed there until they wheeled you out, okay? There really wasn't a lot of movement back and forth. In like the late 70s, early 80s, that started to change and now it's changed completely. 
But the difference is, if you don't all grow up together, do you share the same values? How do you know what the same values are? And so we thought this was important to put together our statement of our mission and our core values. We determined that we'd have 10 core values. If 10's good enough for God, it's good enough for us. We don't need any more than that. Um, and you'll see, you'll see what it is. Our mission is that we're well-qualified, trusted advisors who deliver truly excellent client service every day. That's what we're trying to do every day. And it's not easy to do, but it's what we're committed to doing. Clients come first. We're going to have a high-performing team free of office politics. We're going to base our compensation on performance, which is a, a, a real key for us. Most law firms, the associates and the non-equity partners are paid on a salary and a bonus, depending on how the year, year goes. And it's up to the management to decide what that's going to be. The partners are based a lot of different ways. You'll hear a lot of different things. Some places have lockstep compensation, where it just depends what your seniority you have. That's the money you're going to get. doesn't matter what your performance is. Other places will have some type of, of performance link. Other places will give guarantees to big producers. They'll, they'll pay more for bringing clients in. What we do is we pay our associates and our non-equity officers a salary that we determine and a bonus. And then the shareholders don't just divide up the profits. The shareholders are, are paid based on the amount of money they bring into the firm from working on cases. That's the primary driver. And then there's a little kicker if you're the person who originated the case. But it really requires you to perform to get paid. And if you don't perform, you don't get paid. You'll also hear people talk about that as eat what you kill compensation. Okay. And that sounds like a bad thing, like we're, we're at each other's throats. That's my case, it's not your case, and it's a bad place to work. And that can happen, and it's something we keep our eye on. What we do, since, we, since we've been together so long, again, the core group since the mid-'80s, okay, um, we look out for each other. So if I see that Bill Donnelly is light on work, I'll take some of the work that I have on my desk, and I'll get it over to him. It gets it done faster for the client. It keeps Bill happy, and we move on. If I'm a little bit light, James Murphy may kick something up to me. And so we just keep talking that way to get it done. But that's one of the big key drivers in law firms. And it's probably the biggest thing that drives law firms apart is the, is the compensation issue. We wanted to have minimal bureaucracy, which we believe we do. We want to be financially conservative. So after we got that initial line and we got through those first four months, we actually didn't have to borrow, thank God. And we now don't have one. We just don't do it. We have no debt. We, owe, we have leases that we're obligated to pay every month. But we don't owe money to anybody. And that's a really good feeling. And that's not true of every law firm. Um, we're committed to diversity. We're not doing a great job at this. We're doing an okay job at this, but we got to get a lot better at this. The best thing we do in diversity is that we have very good alternative tracks for partners who want to step out and raise their families. And then particularly, that, that tends to fall on the women attorneys, okay? But it, it can work for both, for men or women. But you can work at our firm. We will give you reduced hours. You can still make partner at our firm with reduced hours. And so we think that encourages women to stay with us uh, longer than maybe they would with others. We're going to develop an all-star team with, by recruiting stars of the profession. No prima donnas. So that means that sometimes you have to do your own filing and you have to do your own copying. And we really don't want to hear a lot of whining about it. Okay? So that's one of the ways you can get into a lot of trouble at our place is to be a, is to be a whiner. We have efficient management. Um, this is kind of a reaction. Uh, Gary, came, Gary LeClaire came from a law firm where everything was in a black box and decisions just were announced from Mount Sinai. He didn't like that. He thought it should be open and there should be a lot of communication. And they have a lot of communication. We thought to the point where they almost overdid it. So we try to find a middle ground where we say, you can, if you want to know what's going on, ask me, I'll tell you. We're not, there's no secrets. But we're not going to have a lot of meetings to, to let you know what's going on. If you want to know about it, come ask. Um, and then finally, our golden rule, our most important rule, we treat our partners with mutual trust and respect. And we use these a lot when we come up with a sticky issue. Okay? So what's, what's one sticky issue? We started out as a, as a law firm, we have to decide on technology. We thought hard about Apple. But in the time frame that we had, we couldn't find the outsourced IT support that would support Apple in a business environment, so we went PC. Well, a lot of our guys <laughs> like Apple stuff. They're Steve Jobs, you know, a Phoenix. A Phil, uh, they love Steve Jobs, sorry. <laughs> and they're going to use that. At a lot of places, they'd say, look, it's a PC environment. That's that. We don't. We, we accommodate that and try to bring that into our IT security system. So that's, that's the sort of thing that our golden rule is, is about. This was our first all-star team that, that went out. Um, so when I went to work for the SEC, the associate director was Joe Goldstein. Jerry Eisenberg was the branch chief. Bill Donnelly was the senior attorney, and I was a junior guy. So a lot of times Murphy will say, you got to go tell those guys 
And I say, I used to work for those guys, James. If I tell them that, they're going to tell me to go do something which I really don't want to do. So we, it, it's just a different way that we have to, that we have to manage different things. Um, so we got, New York, we got Washington and Richmond opened on June 1st, but we really wanted to have a New York office, and we had the infrastructure in place to do it. But our lead lawyer in New York was Paul Marola, who's a well-known securities lawyer in New York. He was on the management team at LeClaire, and we weren't sure if he was as crazy as Murphy and I were and wanted to go with us. And so we felt we could not go to him early and say, hey, we're thinking of leaving, because if he chose not to leave, he's in a terrible situation when Gary LeClaire says, did you know about this? If you knew about this, why didn't you say something? So we kept Paul in the dark. And uh, the way we told him is we were at a securities conference, and we're supposed to have dinner actually with Steve Gannon, who is coming here on April 30th to talk to you. And Steve knows this story. And we, we told Marola to get there half an hour earlier than we told Gannon. So Marola doesn't know this. He goes, hey, Gannon's not here. I'll get him on the cell phone. And he picks up. We said, put, put the cell phone down. We have something we have to tell you about. And we explained it to him, and uh, he didn't really enjoy his dinner that night as much as he might have otherwise. But he, he ultimately decided to come with us, and so on June 14th, our New York office starts. Um, we've gotten better at publicity. We bring Joe Lombard in. Uh, he's a former business guy. A lot of people think this is Photoshopped. It's not. There's a thing called PR Newswire where you can put out uh, PR releases about who's joining your firm, and they kind of get into newspapers and the trade press. And for an extra 75 bucks, only 75 bucks, you can have your picture up in Times Square. Murphy loves that, so we do, we, we do that a lot. Joe was the first one that we did that, we did that with. I want to show you this slide for a couple reasons. Hannah is our senior woman, woman partner. She used to be head of litigation at UBS, so kind of a worldwide uh, bank. Um, we're very lucky to have her. John Bash, he's one of our great associates uh, from Freed Frank. But the real person I want to talk to you about here the, is James Dombeck, who says he's from Georgetown Law, and he is, but he first hails from Elizabethtown College. And he is one of our superstar associates. He does terrific work. He's in particularly has particular expertise in um, exchange trading. So you, you may have heard about Michael Lewis's book Flash Trade, okay? Flash Boys. Flash, Flash Boys. I'm so we it. okay. So we do we do a lot of that stuff. We represent people on both sides of that. And James can probably sit here and tell you about how the dim the, the dark pools work and how what's lighted and what's not. He does a great job in that for us. So we're we're very happy to have a Blue Jay on staff. So we did the Preakness, and after the Preakness comes the Belmont. We had a chance to expand in New York, and so we called it Project Belmont. And that was we got this firm called Krebsback & Snyder. Ted Krebsback is very, very well known in our industry because right now, every case between a customer and a broker-dealer has to be arbitrated. You can't go to court anymore. And the person that got that through was Ted Krebsback. He argued that case in front of the United States Supreme Court, um, Shearson versus McMahon. And so he's kind of the, the grandfather of arbitration in the United States. So getting him to join us with his colleagues was a big coup and really doubled our presence in New York and made us a real presence in New York as a result. And, we, and again, we got some, got some good publicity on that. Um, we talked about an all-star team. This is some of the expertise that we've been able to put together of, of different jobs that people have held at the Securities and Exchange Commission. We have nine former SEC lawyers in a firm of 43 lawyers, nobody has that high of a percentage. And you'll find very few firms of 1,000 lawyers who have nine SEC alums with senior positions like that. In addition, we've just added a lawyer from the Commodities Future Trading Commission, so that gives us more expertise, and the Assistant Chief of the Department of Justice's Fraud Division, who did a lot of work with the LIBOR investigation, any money laundering, so again, a lot of expertise there. We're also very lucky that a lot of our partners held positions in-house. In so uh, both on the legal and on the business side. So we have, so Joe, Joe Lombard was the managing director of global equities at Merrill Lynch. He actually ran the global equities business for them. Uh, Paul Marola was the GC at Instanet, senior legal counsel at Goldman Sachs. We have people who were brokers at Merrill Lynch. We have people who sat on trading desks for hedge funds. And as a result of that, that's a level of experience that we can sell to clients to say, you don't have to teach us your business. We know your business because we've been in your business. We just like practicing law better but that makes us more effective. So that's been very, very helpful to, to our law firm. This, this, was, this was huge for us. So you know about the US News rankings for colleges, I'm sure, E-Town, always near the top. They do the same thing for, law, for lawyers and law firms, and we were voted um, by our peers to be one of the tier one securities regulation firms in the United States. There's only about 20 of them. And we repeated again in 2014, so we're pretty, we're pretty proud of that. 
Um, one of our lawyers, Jerry Eisenberg, um, a lot of people, a lot of us get named best lawyer to the best lawyer list, but Jerry was named the best lawyer in Washington, D.C. for 2013, um, well, for 2012. And, of course, we gave Jerry a big check at our, at our party that, that year for doing that. Um, and then James was just named in Richmond uh, as the best lawyer of the year in Richmond, Virginia. So, again, that's good publicity for us. Um, talk a little bit about marketing. Uh, there are rules about attorney advertising you have to be careful about. You can't really, I can't go up to you and say, hey, I want to be your lawyer. I have to kind of do it to the group. Website's important. So this is our first website. Murphy loved this picture. Murphy thought this picture of this fellow looking at his compass, looking at the Rocky Mountains, showed a, a determination, a grit, a, a confidence that you could get to the other side of a big problem. Other people said, are you a Denver-based law firm? Do you, do you like to hike a lot? What is this? So there's a lot of controversy about what came to be known as Compass Boy. And a lot of our partners hated Compass Boy. Want a Compass Boy to be just gone. And Murphy was able to get one of our best clients at Capital One to send us a, an email to everyone saying, I just want to let you know that I think Compass Boy is one of the most, not since the Visigoths for us here at Capital One, what is your wallet? So have I seen anything as good as Compass Boy? And so we got the message and we got with it at the DC office. We, we now have a, a website that Compass Boy is now in, in the Hall of Fame. Um, we think this website's a little bit better. We get some compliments on it. Brochures are important. So this is our first one. You'll notice the Compass theme remains. Got a little bit better on our first anniversary, but then we got really slick in 2013 um, with, with looking forward. Um, and now in 2014, this is on our website, and I have, a, I have a couple copies up here if anybody wants to page through it. We've gotten good compliments on this. This is something that you can get into the hands of your clients, of friends of the firm, so they remember who you are, and they kind of look through and say, oh, that's nice. A lot of the things that we find is when, when people are thinking about who, are, who am I going to send a case to, what's my referral? Primacy matters. Primacy matters a lot. Who's the last person they saw? Who should this case go to? I just saw Tom. Why don't I send the case to Tom? Or I just got Tom's brochure. Let's send this one to Tom. So it's good to be out there as a result of that. Um, we've also done some advertising. This, again, this is, this is Murphy's idea, and it's a great idea. He got the idea that these are some of the biggest law firms in the United States. How do we capitalize on the fact that our name is with this? Now, what I wanted to do was just do a little jingle. One of these firms is not like the other. <laughs> but they thought that that wouldn't work. So he, we came up with this idea where we congratulated the other firms for being named Tier 1 with us, and we got to mention all their names with us in it. And what I'm waiting for is for the chairman of Arnold and Porter to call up and say, who the hell are you to be congratulating us? We don't even know. But fortunately, that never happened. And so this, is, this has been a good, uh, good advertising campaign for us. Um, we did it in places like the American Lawyer. I show this Paul Clement. Uh, is the former Solicitor General of the United States and a, a noted Supreme Court advocate. He worked for me as a summer associate. I taught him everything he knows. He doesn't, he doesn't agree with that, but I just <laughs> thought I'd show you that. Here's something else we do. This slide is, is, is kind of dark, but we've, we've emphasized our associates. Our associates are where the action is. So we get nice pictures of, of our younger lawyers. You can see it a little bit better, I think, in the, bro, in the brochure. We did the, we did the same thing. And that's something else that a lot of firms don't do. They don't spend a lot of time promoting their younger people. It, helps, it helps, our, helps our folks' morale. It got a lot of buzz going with our clients about, hey, we've never seen anything like that before. So it was an effective campaign for us. We do a number of things in the community, um, and we try to do well by doing good. So we support the uh, Virginia Governor's Legal Food Frenzy, and we've won the award the last several years. There's uh, James Murphy with the then Governor of Virginia, Bob McDonald. He's, he's now under indictment, but that can happen to anybody. Um, <laughs> and Ken Cuccinelli, who is the then attorney, attorney General. So that's nice publicity for our firm. We, we won it again the second year. Uh, support uh, a school up in Harlem. It's one of the things we try to do. We've adopted a Girl Scout troop in Richmond. We do a back to school year thing, buy school supplies for kids at inner city schools, work at the Special Olympics. This didn't work out so well. This was an angel tree where we were gonna buy Christmas presents uh, and give them to underprivileged kids. But as you can see, our guys started liking the toys so much that we weren't able to get them off those bikes. So that was kind of a bust. We support Project Hope, which is a BB&T project uh, that helps bring medical care throughout the world. We do some fun things together. We got together uh, for a baseball game. A lot of firms do, a lot of firms do that. 
Our latest project is that we're bringing everyone together in New York. When we brought the New, the New York firm on, the Krebsbeck firm, they were downtown near the stock exchange. Our firm was midtown near Grand Central. And we, we were looking and looking for space to bring them together. And we finally did that. And so we finally took a floor at 1185 Avenue of the Americas. That's 6th Avenue and 47th Street, right in Midtown, right near Radio City and Grand Central. Um, and it's exciting news for us because we took the whole floor. And so we are, we're going to have to grow in New York now to support that floor. But we got a great deal on rent. And you're always looking for metrics of how do you know you're succeeding, right? What, what, what metrics should you use? Should you use profits per partner? Should you use how many cases you've won? What's your metric? With this office, we now have restrooms dedicated solely to us. No other tenants can use those restrooms besides Murphy and McGonagall people. That, to me, is a good metric. As we said, we're a firm of immigrants coming from, from business, from other law firms, from the, from the government. And that diversity helps us with different ways to approach problems. Here's our three-year report card of what we've done. So we, at, at the three-year mark, we've grown from 14 to 40 lawyers. We're now at 43, 61 employees. Our revenues uh, are up to $26 million, no debt. None of our partners has to have a guarantee. A lot of places, when you start out, and, and when this happened to us as well, when you go to take a lease, they don't just want the corporation's signature. They want your personal signature for your personal assets. And so if things go wrong, not only does the firm go out of business, you go bankrupt. So personal guarantees is a big deal in our business, and, and we don't have them now. We never missed a payroll or draw. That's true of everybody until the first time you do, but it's still something we like. Um, no annual capital contributions. At, when you start a law firm, people who are going to be owners have to kick in some capital. They have to kick in some money. It's generally a significant amount of money, and that's the, the working capital that runs the law firm. Depending on how the law firm manages its capital, you may have to put in additional capital to keep the law firm afloat. We've never had to have people mandatorily put in more capital. Now, what we have done is when we brought in the Krebsbeck firm, remember, day one, no revenue for four months. How are we going to support that? And when we took this big lease up in New York, we have to do construction. We're going to have to pay for all that and buy new furniture. We went to our partnership and said, we need more money. We, we'd like you to kick in some money for us to do that. And our partners were terrific opened up their checkbooks, and so we were able to finance that ourselves, and we didn't have to go to the bank. Again, that's a, that's a pretty important thing for our culture. We own most of the furniture and the equipment. We don't, all the, we don't own all the computers because it doesn't make sense to own all the computers, and it doesn't make sense to own copy machines because we go through a copy machine. We just, a copy machine is like, is like tires on a car. It's only going to last so many copies, and we go through those every three to four years, so we're not going to own those. We're going we're to lease those. We feel we have an all-star team. Um, we have great work, and we have great clients. So, you know, you're going to see uh, John Young from bb and You're going to see Steve Gannon from Capital One, two of our best clients. We represent most of the major banks on Wall Street. If you mention a name, we're probably representing them. We represent most of the exchanges in the United States right now. So that's been a great client list that we've been able to develop through the hard work of our partners. And we feel we put a good reputation together as a result. It hasn't all been fun and games. Um, we lost Jerry Eisenberg about a year ago. Uh, through complications of heart surgery. And he's a, he's a great lawyer, a great friend, a great individual, and someone we miss every day. So we've been spending this whole year, whenever we're doing a talk, we always make sure that we mention Jerry uh, and, how much, and how much we miss him. So now 2014, onwards and upwards, there's our name again on, in, in Wall Street. Again, not Photoshopped, but something that we hope is a beacon for the future. So that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed that. I, we have some time for questions, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Yes, sir. Okay, so um, you mentioned that a lot of your, uh, your partners and your lawyers work for the Securities and Exchange Commission. So they come from a, a background where they were kind of defending the public against some uh, potentially unscrupulous... Against behavior. rapacious, greedy... Sure. No, right. exactly. I mean, I would, <laughs> however you want to phrase it. Um, and then now you're in a position where you're potentially defending the people who are undergoing some of these, as you said... Uh, questionably moral things, or at least are accused of it. Right. Um, so I guess my question would be, how do you uh, find, like, I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this, like, the moral dilemma of, like, do you find yourself, well, we came from the SEC, we have this idea of we're trying to defend the consumer, or the, the, the public, or we're just here for our client, because I know your, uh, uh, your code is about client service, and 
doing that. So how do you balance that with an ethical? That, that's, a great, that's a great question. So, so here we are. The question is, here we're at the SEC, and you're working for the public interest, and you are, and, it, and it's a great place to work, and that ethic is imbued throughout, throughout the place. And now you're going to represent the very people that you were trying to put away. How do you reconcile that? How's that right? I think the first thing I tell you is, is in our profession, Edward Bennett Williams said this, is the first person I heard to say this, but it's, it's true. We're taught to hate the sin, but not the sinner. So we have, people who, we have people who are in jams, and a lot of times they're in jams because of, their own, because of their own fault. They shouldn't have done what they did, but they did it. So what do, you, what do you do with those folks? Well, what we try to do with those folks is get them through the process as responsibly and as equitably as we can. They're gonna to have to pay a price, but they should be, but they should be treated fairly, okay? And they shouldn't be treated unfairly, so we wanna make sure that they get a fair deal. Sometimes they aren't properly accused. Sometimes they're being accused of wrongdoing that they didn't do, or the government is overreaching, and, and you know, you'll read about that in the papers as well. It's not all, it's not all on one side, and so that's our job then to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, this is not right. We should go to trial. We should present this to a court, present this to an arbitration panel, and, and get, a, get an unbiased decision here. And so that's part of it, what we do do. And that's, that's, how we, that's how we balance it. You know, um, we try to be pretty realistic about our clients. I mean, our clients come to us scared. So it's an insider trading case, okay? And this, this person got a call from the SEC. Hey, I saw you bought 100,000 shares of Zoom Inc. the day before it got taken over, and uh, your neighbor happens to be on the Zoom Inc. board. How did that happen? So that person knows that they're in a lot of trouble and they'll, they'll kind of come in and they'll start talking to us. And we, in the office, we have this story that the next person that comes into our office on an insider trading case and tells us the truth the first time we talk to them, that'll be the first person that did that, okay? So we know that the first thing we're gonna hear is a story. And we just have to kind of keep working with them. It's like, okay, yeah, I hear you saying that, but I don't even believe that. Do you really think the government's gonna believe that? And just kind of work it through. And that's part of, part of your responsibility as an attorney is, is you have a responsibility to the client but you also have a responsibility to the system to the truth. And it is, in my judgment, almost always, I wouldn't say almost always, it's always in the client's interest to work with the truth. Going in there, trying to tell a lie, trying to get one by them. I suppose it works from time to time. I've never seen it work. All I've ever seen it do is take a bad situation and turn it into a complete hamburger in an unmanageable situation. You just made something where you have, you've made a mistake, you can live with it and move on. You've now made it something that's career-ending and really stupid. So that's that's how we try to get through that. Thank Thanks. You. Good question. Yes, sir. Another great question where I said we're performance based, so if someone's slow, I got to take something from my desk and give it to them. I'm giving away money that I could have earned myself. Are you guys really that utopian? The answer is so far yes, and it's, and it's because we're small. And I think, I think because of that, there's a limit on the size that we can grow to. I can see us becoming a 70 or 75 person law firm. I don't see us ever becoming an 80 person law firm because I think we would lose that. Um, Another way that I look at it is I'm not, I don't really think I'm giving away money. I'm getting something done quicker for the client and if, 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 because there's only so many hours in a day. So if I can get something done for you this week as opposed to two weeks from now, you're going to like us a lot more. I'm probably going to get more work from you. So that's kind of the leap of faith as well. So it's not all altruistic, okay? If, I'm, if we're turning the work out there quickly at a high level, we're going to get more work. They, they, there's a joke that, that the associates tell that being at a law firm is like a pie eating contest where the prize is more pie. But that's kind of what we're doing. If you do good work, you get more work. I thought I saw one in the corner, no? Yes, sir. Um, in security law, how often do you guys actually go to court and how often do you try cases in court? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. When, when, I, when I was right out of law school in the DA's office, I was in court every day and I was trying to case a week. Um, and now I try a case maybe once every 18, 19 months. Um, and, the, and the reason is because the stakes are extraordinarily high. Um, and so most people find it in their best interest to settle. So I'm, I'm working to get settlements. But that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean we don't try cases. I mean, I'll be trying a case, um, we don't have it to say, I'll be trying a case in July or August because we, we just had a mediation yesterday that went nowhere, so we're clearly going to try that case. So some, some do go to trial. And would that be in federal court then? Um, this one will be in arbitration, but most securities cases are in federal court. Not all of them. A lot of the mortgage cases are in state court or in New York state court, but most cases are in federal court. New York is a very popular venue. 
um, just because the exchanges are there, most commerce, most, most security firms are there, but it's not exclusively. So right now I have a case in um, the Eastern District of Tennessee uh, where, where, where a trust is bringing a case against an insurance company. So it can be all over. Yes, sir. Good, good qu question is, how's our firm's track records on wins or losses? If you hear a lawyer say, tell you he's never, he or she's never lost a case, you're talking to a lawyer who hasn't done a lot of work, okay? <laughs> um, we, think we, have, we think we have a good track record, and we think that's what our peers would tell you. We think that we get settlements that are as good or better than what other people would get. And when we go to court, we have a high degree of success. I think part of that is we're good case appraisers. So if I know a case is a loser, I'm going to tell the client that. If he insists on trying it, I'll try it for him. It's not unethical to do that just because I think as long as I think we have a basis to say find in our favor I'm allowed to do that but I'm saying it doesn't make a lot of sense because they have better evidence than we do yes sir so how comfortable are you with your um, your current niche as far as what you're doing with securities versus some things that might be up and coming like we uh, you mentioned uh, flash boys some of these things with high frequency trading and dark pools that may become more of an issue in the future especially if new regulation is passed are you looking to expand and stay up to date on that, or have you established a good base in something that you're already doing and are trying to stay in that market? The question, good question again. Are, are we going to stay in our niche? We're going to look to expand. We're going to stay in our securities litigation uh, niche, but we think that there, there's, it's broad enough that it will encompass high frequency trading. And it encompassed the mortgage litigation. It encompassed a few years ago mutual fund market timing. So if you're in that niche, Whatever, whatever is going on in the financial world is something that you are prepared and have expertise to cover. So we feel that we have the ability with our different partners to do that. Now, we are looking to expand little bits on the end. So on, on the one end, we don't do a lot of banking regulation. Okay, we do some. But most broker-dealers and most investment advisors these days are owned by banks. So we would be better served, we think, if we could get some banking expertise. So that's something we're actively looking for. On the other side... Um, we're living in an environment where more business activity has been criminalized than, I, than the history of the United States. So 15 years ago, you'd come in and you'd say to me, is this going to be a criminal matter? I would say with confidence, no, it's not. I can't say that anymore. I mean, the, the U.S. attorney in New York in particular is very aggressive, using wiretaps, using informants to search warrants, to investigate business conduct that used to be done with subpoenas and letters. So we have good white-collar uh, experience, but we're looking to expand that as well. We'll try to get try to get some more folks in who do that. Anything else? We'll, thank you very much. I have some brochures up here if you're interested. It's on our website. You've been very kind to me. Thank you so much. <laughs>